Hi there everyone, welcome back to the channel. I'm the GCSE science teacher and in today's video we're going to be revising all the paper two content for GCSE chemistry under 30 minutes. I have recently done videos on the biology course, so paper one and paper two which is out there including some extra stuff for the triple scientists amongst you um, and I am going to be doing the paper two version of this video for physics as well so that will be out very soon. This um, paper one content for chemistry is already out there so I'll link that for you. There's lots of content as you probably gathered um, for science of course but I hope you do find these videos helpful. If you do feel free to join this community and subscribe like the video so I know you enjoy this and if you have any of your own revision tips or tricks and you want to share those with someone else write them in the comments section let's get a discussion going on about how to stay motivated for the exams any tri tricks you've learned along the way any tips advice that kind of thing it's always great to hear from you guys so definitely feel free to write that in the comment section and I would love to read through those comments that you're going to write down um but yeah thank you so much as well for everyone who subscribed I do appreciate it it's incredible so many of you have joined this community so thank you so so much anyway let's get started let's talk about the first topic the rate and extent of chemical change so the first thing we need to know is what is the rate of reaction what do we mean by that because this topic is all about rates of reaction and just reactions in general so a rate of reaction is how quickly a reaction happens in a given time frame and if you think about an industrial process, maybe something like the harbour process that produces ammonia that's used as a fertiliser, that process needs to have specific conditions so we get the best yield, the highest amount of product that forms. Um, and therefore, we can have economical value to that process and it makes a lot of sense financially. So some of the factors that scientists use to kind of increase the rate of reaction include things like temperature, surface area, concentration, gas pressure and catalysts. Now, each of them affect the rate of reaction slightly differently. So we're going to talk about those now. The temperature, if we increase the temperature of a reaction, this can actually increase the successful collisions that occur and the frequency of those collisions. Because what happens happens is the particles gain some kinetic energy and that causes them to move more rapidly and collide more frequently. The surface area, if we were to have a solid reactant and we ground it down into a powder form, that would initially increase the surface area. And as a result, those particles that collide with each of those individual solid uh, dust particles, um, essentially it increases the likelihood of collisions and more collisions to occur. And that's because that surface area has increased. So again, a really good way of maximizing the reactant and causing a faster rate of reaction as well, simply by grinding it up and actually increasing the surface area. Now, concentration is a similar idea to surface area, but in this case, we're often talking more about solutions. So if we have a more concentrated solution, that means we have more particles in a given liquid, and therefore the number of collisions can occur more frequently. Now, let's say our uh, reactants are gases. We can actually increase the pressure on gases and cause them to, if we reduce the volume, let's say, the gas occupies, we can increase the pressure. And that means we have a higher uh, likelihood of frequent collisions as well. So high pressure is often a good option, especially in the case of gases. And last but not least, we have the catalyst. Now, a catalyst is an additional um, substance that we place into the reaction. Um, so it's not really manipulating the reactants that we already have. We have to additionally add something. But a catalyst, what's really good about it is it actually can be used over and over and over again and will never be used up in the reaction. Um, however, with a catalyst, it's initially can be quite expensive. That's why sometimes the other things are done prior to or in addition to. Um, but in the case of a catalyst, what its main job is, it actually lowers the activation energy of that reaction. And activation energy is just the amount of energy, the minimum amount of energy that is needed for a reaction to occur and those collisions to be um, successful because some energy is required for some reactions. Um, remember as well, catalysts you may have heard of in the case of a biology context because biology, biological catalysts are um, enzymes. So that's another kind of link between those curricular ideas. Now, we can actually calculate the rate of reaction with the two um, equations below. And you can see that the mean rate of reaction be, could equal the quantity of a reactant used divided by the time or the quantity of a product formed divided by the time. So again, rate of reaction is all to do with the time it takes for something to occur. And we can actually show this graphically as well. You can see we have a curved line that um, shows the reaction is very fast at the beginning and it slows down gradually. Um, and also, in case you are not sure in terms of the catalyst and the activation energy, this is a graph that you may have seen um, from energy changes in that topic. But again, the activation energy, if we lower it, that's due to catalyst so some things they like you to do in the exam is to draw a reaction profile for say something like an exothermic endothermic reaction that can be found in paper one however if you were, were kind of having a bit of a crossover here if we were to look at the um, activation energy it would just be a smaller peak on that graph just as a bit of a recap now something else to mention at this point i know i've mentioned about collisions and that's just a fancy way of saying um, things banging into each other okay so when two pro uh, two reactants collide um, that's when a reaction occurs but there's a bit more to it than that um, there's this idea of collision theory so essentially collision theory states that if you increase the frequency of collisions you'll have a successful reaction if you increase the energy of collisions the same can be said and also 
if we decrease the energy needed for a collision to be successful, this can also help benefit that rate of reaction. So you can see there's two situations here. We've got two, two specific reactants. They don't collide. So there's no reaction. But if they do, there is um, a reaction that occurs and a new product will form. Now, if you're studying the higher tier course um, and the triple science course, you'll definitely need to know about something called Le Chatelier's principle. So what does Le Chatelier's principle actually tell us? Essentially, it states that in a system, in a reaction, like a closed system, uh, where nothing can really get in and out, that's what a closed system is. Essentially, it states that if a change is made to any of the conditions, whether it's temperature or whether it's pressure, then the system responds to counteract that change. And this occurs in reversible reactions. So you can see we've got A plus B that goes to make C plus D. But we can also say the other version of that is C plus D goes to make B and A. And this is what we call a reversible reaction. So that arrow you see there is showing the reaction occurring in both directions. So essentially, the effect of changing conditions on a system at equilibrium can be predicted using Le Chatelier's principle. So I've mentioned temperature and I've mentioned pressure. And we're going to talk about what can occur and what you need to know for these two specific conditions. So let's talk about pressure, first of all. So in the exam, if they give you an equation, it needs to be a simple equation because you're going to use the coefficients that are found there. So definitely go check out my moles video. I did, um, and I'll link it for you in the cards. But essentially, on a balanced simple equation, you'll see the different number of moles or the coefficients that represent how many of each molecule there is, okay? And um, what you're going to do, if we increase the pressure on a reaction, um, and we're talking about gases in the reaction, the equilibrium will shift to relieve some of that pressure. So it will shift and move towards the side of the equation, the side of those arrows um, that has less particles, less moles of, of substance. And that relieves some of the pressure there. So essentially, you want to look at your balanced symbol equation and you want to look for how many moles are on either side and choose the one that has less moles. And that's the shift that equilibrium will choose based on increased pressure. Now, in the case of temperature change, if you have a reversible reaction, they will tell you in the exam which way is the exothermic version of the reaction and which way is the endothermic reaction. They may tell you both, they may only tell you one, but essentially, if we increase the, pre the temperature on a reaction, we actually will say that equilibri equilibrium will shift to the endothermic side, and that's to kind of counteract that change that's there. So let's say the forward reaction is exothermic, the reverse reaction is endothermic, and we increase the temperature, the equilibrium will shift to favour the endothermic reaction side. Now, there is one more condition that you should know for Le Chatelier's principle, and that's the idea of concentration. So it's really important, you know, on the left hand side, we have our reactants. On the right hand side, we have our products, because in the case of concentration, if we were to increase the concentration of reactants, that means we actually want to favor the side that has the products that form. So essentially, in the case of Le Chatelier's principle, whatever is happening to that reaction, the opposite will occur to counteract that change, because essentially chemistry is all about chaos and balance. And it's kind of the same in this case. Um, if you increase the temperature, it wants to bring it back down. If you, It's kind of like the homeostasis of chemistry, if you if you think of it like that. So it's a good, it's a good way to understand this principle. But what I would recommend with this particular topic, practice lots of questions and do use the ideas from paper one, such as moles, um, other reaction ideas, reaction profiles for this particular topic. Definitely look back at those ideas because it will strengthen your understanding of this topic as well. Now, there's another um, bit of information I want to mention before we move on. In terms of the copper sulfate, copper 2 sulfate specifically, the anhydrous and hydrated version, you may have seen this in class before. You may actually get asked about it. Um, essentially, it's a powder version of copper. And you can see that if it's hydrated, it has like a blue color to it. If it's anhydrous and not hydrated, it has a white color to it. Essentially, this is a really good example of a reversible reaction. It's often talked about in the exam. So it's just worth knowing the word anhydrous, things like that. It can throw students off. But don't fear this. This is kind of just another way of them asking you to apply your knowledge. And there is a required practical as well that I'll mention here. So the required practical essentially is to investigate the rate of reactions by color change. You may have actually heard of this one as the disappearing cross experiment. And essentially what you're doing is you're reacting sodium thiosulfate with hydrochloric acid. And what is going to form is um, sulfur gas, um, which is particularly hazardous. You don't want to be breathing any of this in. Often you'll do this in a fume cupboard or in a really well ventilated space. Um, but essentially it has this kind of yellowy, creamy white precipitate that forms in the solution. Um, and sulfur dioxide is the gas, but the sulfur itself is this um, the precipitate that forms. And that's what kind of gives that disappearing cross vibe. Essentially, it's the cross. You can't see it anymore because what you have is a conical flask with the solution inside um, the sodium thiosulfate and the hydrochloric acid. Um, you place them in together and you will have underneath that um, conical flask, you'll have a piece of paper that has a cross on on it. Um, it could be something else, but for, for most 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 of the time it is a cross. Um, and you'll eventually start to not see that cross through the conical flask because the precipitate forms. You also do form, like I said, sulfur dioxide, which is particularly hazardous. You don't want to breathe that in. Um, sodium chloride, which is a salt and water as well. Um, but it is just worth knowing those different um, products that form and the hazards associated. Now we can actually, with this experiment, what you're doing is you're looking to see how quickly this occurs. Um, so you could increase the temperature on it. You could um, increase the surface area. You can increase the concentration um, in terms of the acid. All of these can increase the rate of reaction. So you could actually 
take that data and graphically represent it. And you should be able to see that over time, if you increase those different factors that affect rate of reaction, um, you should be able to see the increased rate. However, I would say, so you have results that are reliable and accurate, you only want to choose one of those variables at any time so that you kind of keep the rest of them controlled. So let's say you choose temperature, for example, um, you would control surface area concentration, um, a catalyst, not that you'd use a catalyst, but if you had that available, all of that needs to be controlled if you're just using the temperature to see how quickly it occurs. Um, so that's something to mention. Um, variables are very important and you could be expected to write a method on this. So yeah, definitely make sure you've revised that practical, but also, um, like I say, the variables are very important to understand the difference of. Just as a bit of a rundown, if you're not sure, um, a control variable is something you keep the same um, for comparable results. Um, your independent variable is something that you are going to um, you're going to change. So your independent variable is something you're changing each time. Maybe it's the acid, for example, um, in, a, in a reaction, or maybe it's the type of reactant in itself. Whatever the case is, something you're changing. Um, in this case, if you're looking at investigating temperature, it would be the temperature you're going to change each time. You're going to use a hot temperature, a colder temperature, a medium temperature and see the effects of that. Um, and then you also have your dependent variable. So this is what you're measuring. So what we're measuring in this case is how quickly that reaction occurs. So um, those are just a bit of helpful hints for you guys as you're revising. Okay, so in the case of organic chemistry, the first idea is crude oil. Now, crude oil comes from dead organisms, specifically plankton, that has died over millions of years and has been crushed under high pressure and heat and is formed in the Earth's crust. And this crude oil, as the name would suggest, is in a crude state. So we actually, as scientists, when we extract this, we actually need to utilize it and separate it because essentially it's a mixture of hydrocarbons that don't really have any useful purpose in its raw state. So there's two methods we can use. Um, cracking of alkenes is a good option, but fractional distillation is something that we would use to separate those hydrocarbons. And We'll come on to those ideas in a moment. But hydrocarbon itself is a molecule made up of hydrogen and carbon. And there's two families of hydrocarbons you should know. The first is an alkane, and this has essentially uh, carbon atoms covalently bonded together and hydrogen atoms as well. Now, there's a lot of hydrogen atoms because there is a single bond that forms with each carbon. Um, atom. There is only a single bond. This is what we call a saturated uh, hydrocarbon because there's lots of hydrogen there. It saturates the carbon molecule or the carbon atom, I should say, with the four possible um, hydrogen bonds that can occur. However, there are essentially lots of different versions of an alkane depending on how long the chain is. So if you have one carbon in the molecule, we would call this methane. If we had two, it'd be ethane. Three is propane and four is butane. Now there's lots more than this, but the four there are the key ones you should know. In the case of an alkene, however, this is still a hydrocarbon. However, it has a carbon-carbon double bond and because of that double bond, you need two carbon atoms at least. So there's no such thing as methane. Um, it would start off with ethene, which is two carbons, then it'd be propene, then it would be butene, and so on and so forth. Essentially, that is what we call a unsaturated hydrocarbon because it has that double bond. And we can actually identify alkenes from alkanes by using bromine water. And in the presence of an alkene, bromine water will decolorize. Um, it's a clear brownish, reddish, orangey color, but it decolorizes. It's still clear, it just doesn't have that color to it anymore. Now, um, in the case of the hydrocarbons, when we collect them from the crude oil, as I said, crude oil isn't useful in its natural state. So what can occur is we use this process of fractional distillation. And this essentially is when we heat up the crude oil to around, well, it's a very high temperature, around 350 degrees Celsius. And essentially that crude oil in a liquid form will vaporize into a gaseous state. And at very low boiling points, when the chain lengths are very, very small, as the vapors occur, the, the crude oil uh, fractionating column that the crude oil has uh, evaporated into, it actually cools uh, slowly. And especially at the top, it's very, very cold. And that causes the uh, vapors to actually condense and turn back into a liquid. Um, some of them actually just are so uh, low in boiling point, they actually stay as vapors. So we start off with liquefied petroleum gas. We then have petrol. Um, we then have kerosene, diesel, heavy fuel oil, bitumen, which is the uh, lower um, lower down on the fractionating column because it has a high boiling point. But essentially, you should know the different fractions that can come out of the fractionating column in the case of fractional distillation. And a mnemonic I've come up with is lively puppies, no dog howl and bark. So L for liquefied petroleum gas, P for petrol, um, K for kerosene, D for dogs, H for heavy fuel and B for bitumen. Um, so yeah, hopefully that helps you guys. But essentially, that's the process. We're using this separation technique to separate the different fractions from crude oil and therefore they're now useful because things like petrol can be used to fuel cars. Um, bitumen can be used to uh, help produce roads and things like this, kerosene for planes, loads more uses than just crude oil in its natural state. So um, that's kind of the key idea with it. 
Um, another thing to mention, especially if you're doing your combined um, course, um, but this is for everybody as well, is combustion reactions. So remember, in the case of crude oil or just fuels in general, we burn them. So combustion is about burning things. Um, and there's two versions of combustion. We have complete combustion and we also have incomplete. So in the case of complete combustion, a hydrocarbon is burnt in a plentiful supply of oxygen, lots and lots of oxygen, and this will form carbon dioxide and water. Now, in the case of incomplete combustion, this can actually produce a toxic substance because there's not enough oxygen present when burning that fuel. And the toxic substance is carbon monoxide. It's an odorless and colorless gas, but it is obviously poisonous as well. So it's very dangerous and it's not easily recognized unless you have a carbon monoxide alarm. Water is also formed, but also carbon soot, which is kind of like a particulate that can cause um, asthmatic issues or respiratory problems as well. So again, more hazardous than say complete combustion. First thing you want to know is the required practical, and this is for simple paper chromatography. And essentially, this particular type of chromatography kind of links to other practical methods. So if you have to write a method, you want to make sure it's in a logical flow. You want to make sure you're using numbered bullet points. Key words are included. You also want to make sure that any data you would need to obtain from this reaction or, or this experiment, I should say, is also um, indicative in your writing. So you get that leveled answer. The high top marks um, are awarded to you for that level of detail. Um, but essentially, in the case of a chromatography practical, you want to be aware that you'd need to use a pencil to draw the line um, about a few centimetres or so from the bottom of the chromatography paper. And this would be in pencil to ensure that no ink is used, which could affect your results. You also want to place a small amount of your substance on your line and you also want to write in pencil what that substance is because once you place it into your mobile phase or that solvent you're using it could be water it could be ethanol um, it could be acetone something like this that's going to help move that substance up and through the uh, chromatography paper by capillary action essentially that's going to help drag that solution or that substance up upwards and separate it because chromatography is a separation technique um, and what you're going to do is understand there are two phases in chromatography. You have your stationary phase and your mobile phase. And essentially it's the affinity each of those stages have that determines if it's a mobile or stationary phase. But for short, kind of to help you out a little bit, a stationary phase is often the paper and the mobile phase is often the solution. But you really want to be talking about the affinity that each of those substances have to that particular um, substance that's being separated. But what you'll have at the end, once the solutions or the substance has been separated, say the dye or the chemical um, or the ink, you will have what we call a chromatogram. And we can actually use the chromatogram to identify the substances that are within that solution. So you can see here we have some data. We've got black ink, which has lots of different, different pigments inside. We've got a pure substance. We've got an impure substance. Essentially, it helps us to identify what is in there if we already have some data that we can compare it to. Um, but we can also see if the substance is pure and impure as well, depending on whether it has more than one substance or more than one, uh, lots and lots of substances. Um, so it's a really useful technique. The thing you could be asked about is the maths that links to this, and this is all to do with retention factor, so RF values. And essentially, the RF value is used to quantify and compare that substance because we could say, yeah, that looks about right, that's probably found in this one, that's probably found in that one, if we compare it to data and just eyeball it. However, we actually can use maths and actually use a retention factor to quantify our results and be completely accurate as we are scientists after all. So how do we calculate retention factor? Well, we want to use distance traveled by the substance divided by the distance traveled by the solvent, and this will give us a ratio, a number between zero to zero and one. Um, but what do those numbers mean? Well, zero essentially means the substance is not attracted to the mobile phase, whereas one means the substance is attracted to the mobile phase, but is not attracted to the stationary phase. So essentially, the higher the number, the further it moves and the further it separates. So this is kind of a nice way to compare your results. If you already have some data, um, they could ask you in the exam to identify the substances that are found within um, an unknown substance. That could be something they do. Um, but yeah, I, again, would recommend you understand how this practical works. Um, if you haven't done the video or the practical yourself, there may be some videos on YouTube that can help you. I'll link some in the description box. But again, it's good to know how to write a method for this and also the data and the results that go before humans, before life form. Um, there was high amounts of carbon dioxide and very low amounts of oxygen, nitrogen, methane, and ammonia were also very low in comparison to carbon dioxide and this was all due to volcanic activity however over time our modern atmosphere has evolved and we now have much less carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and this is thanks to photosynthesis where plants absorb carbon dioxide and release oxygen hence why the levels of oxygen have also increased carbon dioxide is also massively reduced due to um the carbon sinks that occur in the world. So things like sedimentary rocks, carbon is often locked in those. We also have oceans which act as a big carbon sink. Carbon dioxide can actually dissolve in oceans as well. So it's a carbon store. Carbon is also cycled in the environment. Everything that's alive on earth contains carbon. So um, carbon is also uptaken um, in food chains and things like this as well. Nitrogen has also increased. It's relatively uh, stable. It's very unreactive. It has just accumulated over time. And um, it's worth mentioning carbon dioxide is actually a greenhouse gas. And through the uh, human activities, things like deforestation or cutting down trees, burning fossil fuels, carbon dioxide has started to rise again. And it's worth knowing that the, the most prevalent gas in our atmosphere is nitrogen at 78%. Oxygen is around 20, 21% and carbon dioxide is slightly less than this. Um, so it's, it's worth being aware of those data points, those numbers as well. And like I said, I have done videos on some of this. So I'll link this for you guys in the description box as well. 
Now, like I said, we have greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide. We also have nitrous oxide, water vapor, and methane. Um, we also have sulfur dioxide as well. These all can impact the planet based on the effects they have. So the nitrous oxide and sulfur dioxide, these can mix with water vapor and cause acid rain, causing um, lakes to acidify, fish to die, other aquatic animals to die, and also corrosion of buildings as well. And trees can also be impacted and damaged as well. And this is an example of pollution. Um, another example of pollution is in the case of eutrophication. So essentially when Lots of fertilizers or sewage are uh, essentially run off into lakes and rivers, and this causes an increase in algae, something called algal bloom. And this means that algae on the surface of the water will actually be encouraged to grow by the increased number of nutrients from those substances. And as a result, this causes the total blockage of sunlight to the lower life forms under the water and the other plants. And this means less photosynthesis of those plants occur. This means there's less oxygen in the water for aquatic animals to survive and therefore fish and other aquatic animals will die. So it's very hazardous um, and harmful to those organisms that are in there. Um, and it's something that we should be mindful of. Um, another human impact is landfills and the lack of renewable resources being used or reusing, sub reusing substances that can be reused over time. So glass, aluminium, uh, plastics. If we throw them into landfills, they actually over time will degrade and break down and release methane, which adds to the problem of global warming. So this whole idea of global warming is linked to the greenhouse effect. And if we increase the number of um, greenhouse gases, it actually can trap the UV rays or the uh, shorter wavelengths of radiation from the sun. Some of it is essentially transmitted back into space, but some of it does get trapped and absorbed. And this is through the layer of gases, those greenhouse gases that are in our Earth's atmosphere. And the more gases there are, the more the temperature increases. So the last topic is using resources, a really important one, because actually it's looking at how different materials that we use and need in society, where they come from and the impact they have when we collect them or utilize them. And also looking forward about how we can be responsible when we use these resources and what we need to do moving forward to maintain the ones we have and not destroy any more of the planet to collect more of these resources. So the first resource we need to talk about is metals. Metals are found in abundance everywhere in terms of the devices we use, the transportation we use. If you look around the room you're in now, you'll find an object that's made of metal. And where does that metal come from? Well, it comes from the Earth's crust and it's found in a metal ore, which is a piece of rock that contains some of the metal oxide. Essentially, it's metal oxide that's, that's found there. Um, some metals, of course, are very unreactive and you can find them in their natural state, such as gold and other precious metals. But for the most part, metals have reacted to form this metal ore. And we need to extract them using different techniques, things like electrolysis, reduction with carbon, phyto mining, bio leaching, loads of different techniques that actually help extract that metal so we can use it. Um, but obviously by extracting the metal in the first place by using mining techniques, this can have an impact on the environment in a negative way. So any metals we do have, we want to be able to recycle them and melt them down to basically make something new or better yet reuse them because recycling although it's really helpful um it is actually also leading to uh, global warming because you have to transport the substances or the, or the uh, products you have to melt them down or crush them all of this requires energy um people have to actually do this in the first place um so there's a bit there's a bit less uh, of a positive than say reusing something or even just reducing the amount of things you use um phyto mining and bio leaching by the way um these are two techniques that are actually used um, less commonly than electrolysis electrolysis we've talked about in paper one but essentially it's the breakdown or the extraction of metals from a solution or a molten compound um, and this just uses electricity to do that based on the charges so metals have a positive charge and they'll move to one of the uh, essentially one of the electrodes that has the uh, the charge that's kind of attracting it. So I'll link a video for you if you'd like to learn more. But phyto mining and bio leaching, like I said, these are two techniques to essentially collect the metal. So phyto mining uses plants that have absorbed metal ions through the soil. Um, essentially, if the soil is rich in those minerals, um, we would collect the plants and burn them and collect the metals. We also have bio leaching, which uses bacteria to um, essentially collect metal and extract them as well. Um, Another type of material that is particularly useful in society and we use a lot is plastics. Plastics come from crude oil, which is, like I've said before, a hydrocarbon or a mixture, specifically the ethene in crude oil and the alkene. Um, we can also form uh, plastics from um, ethanol by obtaining that ethene um, during a fermentation process. And actually, we can actually use um, a renewable crop uh, industrial techniques to obtain this. However, ethene and plastics essentially come from crude oil, which is not ideal because a lot of the plastics that we use today can be um, recycled but aren't often um, but producing more plastic from crude oil again exemplifies the problem that we have with climate change and fossil fuels so what can we do i mean it sounds quite negative but what can we actually do we have something called a life cycle assessment which actually a lot of employers use a lot of companies use and have to prove and write down and show governing bodies that this product actually has a good life cycle a good life cycle assessment so what do, what do we mean by that if we have a product 
we want to know where it came from and where it's going to go and it's lifetime the impact it would have on the environment so some products are single use such as medical products so you can't reuse them essentially and that we understand as a society is fine that that is kind of the way it has to be but some products that are single use we know actually have an impact on the environment and we could actually change the way we make them and change our behavior so that actually instead of being single use we could actually reuse it and have less of an impact so it looks at where the resource comes from the um, environmental impact it has so does it go straight into a landfill can it be reused is the material recyclable and a lot of the products you find in the shops these days will actually say how to recycle your products and a lot of consumers who buy these things are looking for products that are reusable and are recyclable and that's often what happens is consumers push this idea onto the product designers so that they can kind of help manipulate and change the product specifications so that there is less of an impact on the environment so it's life cycle assessments are really useful and that's it from me today. I've been the GCSE science teacher and you have been curious. If you did enjoy this video, let me know by giving it a thumbs up, share it with someone else so they don't miss out. And please do subscribe if you haven't already. Thank you so much for your support. I do appreciate it. Take care and I'll catch you in the next one.